Okay, thank you everybody. I'm happy to be here. Thanks to uh, Jason for having me. You're probably wondering why I'm walking out on stage with a baseball bat. Um, and maybe you saw me walking in. People tend to take a couple steps back when I come walking in. But I'm going to use it just to sort of, um, I swear I won't swing it around like this the whole time. I'm going to use it to just sort of give you some visualizations on um, this game that is called Beat the Streak and some of the things that I'm doing with machine learning to try and predict and eventually, hopefully, maybe win, but you know, the maybe is a pretty strong maybe at this point. So let's get into it. This is called Beat the Streak, this game. So my name is Lucas Kelly. I'm a data scientist at the World Wildlife Fund. I go to work, and I try not to think about baseball all day long, but it still pops into my head. Um, the baseball work that I'm talking to you about today, I swear, don't tell my boss, it, you know, it happens before work, OK, and after work, too, never during work. But it's basically work. I'm just sort of using this um, data science world that I live in. This is like my passion project. So I've been working on this for a few years. I've been playing this game more than that, but the game is um, so complicated and difficult that um, I decided I think a machine learning model could at least help. And that's what I'll be talking to you about today. So here's what. I'll break this talk down into pieces. The first is I'll explain to you what this game is called Beat the Streak and why it's so hard and um, why, with everything I just said, it's still fun to play. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about what it, what it means to actually build a model to help predict the outcome, predict essentially a hit every single day. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about the challenges of actually deploying that model. So, you know, it's it actually is really easy to build a model for this, but it's very difficult to deploy a model. Um, and you'll understand what I, you probably, if you're a data scientist, understand what I mean by that right away, but um, I'll make that more clear as I go on. The fun thing about baseball is it's very unpredictable. I mean, certainly, you know, there's a lot of predictive things happening. Um, I could tell you probably a couple things that are likely to happen today um, in today's games. but. Baseball is fun to watch because the unpredictable happens all the time. It happens every single day. So when you go to actually try and predict what's going to happen in a, in a Major League Baseball game, um, you typically tend to feel pretty bad about yourself on a regular basis of, at how much you're failing. Um, and then I'm going to talk to you about like actually evaluating the model that I've built. There's already a model out there. Um, as you know, you, you, many of you here have probably come up with excellent data, sort of analytical ideas. And you get real excited about it, and you Google it, and like five people have already done it and are making money off of it, right? So that's, that's sort of where I am. That's my model is called Jolt. And I'm um, kind of comparing my results with a model that's already out there that MLB is actually putting out. So this is the game. It's called Beat the Streak. And believe it or not, if you win this game, you can win $5.6 million. And so that is enough to get enough, you know, plenty of people to sign up and download the app. You could download the app on your phone right now as I'm speaking. It won't bother me if I see you staring at your phone. You could play the game. You could make a pick. Um, it's a lot of fun. Um, and it's built around Jolton Joe DiMaggio, hence the name of my model, Jolt. It's a, um, an ode to one of the greatest hitters of all time. Jolton Joe DiMaggio, uh, it's funny. I gave this talk <laughs> earlier this week to a baseball audience, and I basically just breezed over this slide. You don't really have to talk about Jolt and Joe DiMaggio to baseball people. Um, if you don't know much about baseball, uh, he's in the Hall of Fame. He hit 408. That's incredible. Nobody in today's game at the end of the season in a single season ever hits like even 300 anymore. And he hit 400 in that time span. He actually didn't hit 400 um, in that single season in 1941. Um, but there was a span between May and mid-May and mid-July where he was just on fire. So the, the real reason that the game is, surrounds him is because he had a hit streak. He hit 56 hits uh, in a row, and that's per game. So it's not like he hit two um, and then missed a game and then, and then you know, hit again. He hit every single game in that 56 span. He had at least one hit. And a hit, remember, is different than getting on base. If you walk, that's not a hit. So he's actually putting the ball in play. He's getting a hit 56 times in a row. It's, no one has ever really even come close to breaking this record. And it's, it's kind of common knowledge, not common knowledge, but common, um, thank you, understanding that it's not, it's not going to be broken. It's a record that will not be broken. Oh, 
one thing I always like to point out here is um, they just don't make them like they used to. Joe DiMaggio was one of the most incredible hitters um, of all time. He went away to serve in the military in war for, I think, two or three years, and then he came back to legendary status as a New York Yankee. So um, really, n not only an incredible baseball player, but an incredible person, too. Here's a quote from Joe DiMaggio while this um, hit streak was happening. He said, why should I worry? The only time to worry is when you're not hitting. He said during the time of his streak, I'm not worried now, I'm happy. It's no strain to keep on hitting, it's a strain not to be hitting. That's when your nerves get jumpy. So you can tell uh, hitting is a good thing. I, um, my, my baseball career ended um, before I even reached high school. I just, didn't, I just didn't want to stick around at school. I hated school. So the thought of staying after school just sounded terrible. So I'm not a good baseball player. Um, I'm pretty good at analyzing baseball data. I write for a website called Fangraphs. I write there three times a week. You can read my writing. Every week I'm doing some sort of analysis on baseball. Um, and I'm putting, I'm putting it out there for the world to see. Um, but I can tell you, I just recently got talked into playing uh, again as an adult. So now I'm actually paying my own money to play baseball with other out of shape 30 year old, 40 year old men. And um, it's not pretty. I make a lot more noises now just running for a routine fly ball than when I used to. But I can tell you that it feels incredible to get a hit. It feels so good because it's difficult to do. It is really, really difficult to do. So here on the left side of the screen is one of probably, this could be debated at, at, a, at a bar for, for hours on end, who was the better hitter? Um, I think a lot of people would probably say Ted Williams. That's Ted Williams in the, in the Red Sox uniform. Um, he wrote this book called The Science of Hitting. And I'm going to read just a little bit from what is commonly known as the greatest hitter of all time, Ted Williams, uh, talking about how hard it is to get a hit. He says, hitting a baseball, I've said it a thousand times, is the single most difficult thing to do in sport. I get raised eyebrows and occasional arguments when I say that, but what else is there that's harder to do? What is there that requires more natural ability, more physical dexterity, more mental alertness? That requires a greater finesse to go with physical strength, and that has as many variables, that's something to remember, and as few constants that carries with it the continuing frustration of knowing that even if you are a 300 hitter, which is rare these days, you're going to fail at your job seven out of 10 times. If Joe Montana or Dan Marino completed three of every 10 passes they attempted, they would be ex-professional quarterbacks. If Larry Bird or Magic Johnson made three of every 10 shots they took, their coaches would take the basketball away from them. Golf? Somebody always mentions golf. You don't have to have good eyesight to play golf. Tommy Armoire was a terrific golfer and he had no sight in one eye. You have, to look, you have to have good eyesight to hit a baseball. Look at the tragedy of Tony Con Conigliario of the Red Sox. Six foot three, beautifully developed, strong, aggressive, stylish, and injured in one eye, and that ended his career. When I managed the Washington Senators, I insisted that Mike Epstein get his eyes checked. He was having difficulties hitting, and I suspected it might be partially due to his vision. He did. And with new contact lenses, he had his best season with the Senators, just a tiny correction. You don't have to have good speed to succeed at golf or great strength or exceptional coordination. You don't have to be quick. You don't have to be young. Golfers win major tournaments when they're in their 50s. I hit 316 when I was 42 years old and was considered an old, old man in the game. You never hear a boo in golf. I know that's a factor. You don't have a pitcher throwing curves, sliders, knuckleballs, and if he doesn't like you, maybe a fastball at your head. There's nothing to hurt you in golf unless lightning strikes or somebody throws a club. And there's that golf ball sitting right there for you to hit with a fat-faced club waiting for you to hit it with. So there is Ted Williams, the writer of this book, The Science of Hitting, telling you just how hard it is to actually hit a baseball. And I guess because I like the feeling of failure, I've decided to write a machine learning uh, model that sort of makes me fail seven out of 10 times.
Here's the uh, interface for the game. It's called MLB Beat the Streak. You can get it on MLB Play. This is the online interface. You could download the app and do it on your phone. But there's just tons of data um, here, which I'll show you in a slide in a second. Every day, your goal is to just pick one hitter that you think will get a hit that day. And you have to do that 56 times in a row. And if you do that, you could win $5.6 million. You could be filthy rich. Uh, just by picking other people to do uh, impressive things. So in this case, uh, this was, I think, this was Monday night. I was putting these slides together. And um, Wander Franco was MLB's top pick. So there's a couple things going on here you might be a little suspicious. Why would MLB, who's hosting this and putting up money, MGM is the one who actually puts up the money, the big gambling casino, um, why would they help you make your pick? Uh, it just goes to show you how hard this game really is. Uh, a mathematician on Reddit actually put the numbers together and the, the probability of doing this consecutively, making this pick, is infinitesimally small. I mean, nobody in their right mind would actually um, put up their money. And that's another reason why this game is free to play. So on Monday, they said Wander Franco's got a 74% chance of getting a hit. Um, I made my pick after that game had started. It was a day game. So if you're not up early in the morning making your picks, then you're, you're losing out. Like, if you don't time it right, you could, you could miss the best pick. I missed the best pick by MLB's model that day. But the second best um, pick was uh, Nate Lowe of the Texas Rangers. So keep that in mind as we keep moving. You can also see that, um, I wish I was up here telling you, oh, I'm so good at this, this is so cool, machine learning is helping me. My streak is at two right now. So uh, <laughs> I didn't, I could have like, you know, altered the image to make myself look better, but I'm trying to point out that it's a hard thing to do. Here's a, um, let's see if I can get this to play with a click. There we go. Here's the interface that MLB supplies. There's so much data going on here. Marcus Simeon has a hit streak of 24 right now. His season average is 300. Gives you all the hitters who are hitting well right now. It gives you the best matchup. So which batter versus which pit pitcher um, has the most historically good hits, right? Which batter does the best? It also breaks down just the teams. So which, which teams are playing each other and which teams give up the most hits. And it does the same thing for the pitcher. So it says here, Hunter Brown is giving up, he's projected to give up 6.2 hits. That's a projection. So they're also running, they're running many different models, lay, layering them on top of each other to give you as much insight into, into the game as possible. Um, just a little bit more about the rules. Uh, you pick any player that you want, any day. So again, like, let's say on Monday, I did pick Wander Franco. Um, I could pick him tomorrow. I could pick him three days in a row. I could pick him four days in a row he would actually have to go on a four game hit streak for me to, for, for that to work. But um, the point is you don't, you're not limited in your picks. You can pick any MLB player that is playing that day. If your player, if your pick does not play that day, maybe the manager said you need a day off, you need a rest, and he doesn't play, it's just a pass. So if you had like a, a 10 game hit streak going, you picked Wander Franco, he got hurt right before the game and he didn't play, um, you would still keep your streak of 10. There's this added little thing called a double down. You can pick two batters. It's like, <laughs> you know, it's like a gambling thing. Like they go, ooh, you could do this. And it becomes even harder. But you get two uh, against your streak if you can pick, if they both get a hit, right? So in this case, if I, in, the, in the slide before, if I, if I picked Wanda Franco and Nate Lowe, um, I would go up to two. But if Wanda Franco got a hit and Nate Lowe did not get a hit, I'm back down to zero. So it's a real gamble. You need to pick, if you double down, you have to have both of those hitters um, successfully get a hit. And of course, I just showed you MLB is giving you all kinds of tips and tricks for strategy. Um, there's all kinds of things that you could think of. Like, for example, if you're, there's nine batters in a lineup on a baseball team for, for every single team. All nine of them are going to hit. If you pick the first batter, the leadoff batter, he's going to get up to bat more often than the nine hitter. So he'll probably hit four times in a game, whereas the number nine hitter probably will only hit three times. That's, that's just a bit of strategy. So you have more opportunity if you're picking that first batter. Um, and then you saw all kinds of things like the, um, the opponent 
you know, um, let's see. Um, I'm kind of blanking right now, but one of the best pitchers um, today in this current season, I'm just going to say um, Zach, say? Kershaw. Kershaw has been good. He's been really good, actually. He just had a really good game. So, yes, Kershaw, thank you. Kershaw um, is a good pitcher, really good pitcher. You probably wouldn't want to pick against Kershaw. Um, maybe you would. Maybe the model tells me something, but I'll go through an example where if the model is telling me so-and-so is going to get a hit against Kershaw, I'm usually like, I don't think so. So that's a bit of strategy, too. And then one thing that's really important um, is to look at the bullpen. So there's a starting pitcher for every, every team, right? He's usually going to pitch, like, on average, six innings. It can be shorter or longer. But then the bullpen comes in. So if you've made all of your decision based off the hitter and the starting pitcher, but then the starting pitcher goes out and some other pitcher comes in, you have to think, well, now the game has changed. Now the hitter is seeing a completely different pitcher, and uh, I need to change my, my analysis. But as I'm going to get into in a minute, that's impossible, nearly impossible to predict. I don't know, who's going to, I don't know how long Kershaw is going to last tomorrow, and I don't know necessarily, I could guess, but I don't necessarily know which reliever is going to come in to pitch after him. So it's a challenging thing when, he, when it comes to predicting because you don't know what features you should be building out on your deployment data set. So let's talk about the um, obvious sort of thing. Back in the day, you should have just picked Joe DiMaggio. He was on an incredible hit streak. Or if this game was running, you, if you didn't pick Ted Williams on a regular basis, then you just were not being smart. Um, Luis Arise today is batting 400. It's something that is literally like hasn't happened in years. A, a batter hasn't reached a consistent 400 level for quite a long time. Um, he's probably not going to hit 400 for the whole season. It would be awesome if he did, but he's probably not. It's just kind of like, I don't know, it's pretty difficult. Mark my words, you could, you could call me up and tell me I was wrong at the end of the season, and I hope that happens, but he's probably not going to hit 400 on the full season. However, if, on the very bottom of the screen, you chose Luis Arise on May 24th to get a hit, you would have been right, and you would have felt that little dopamine rush of having successfully predicted the future, right? If you did it on the 26th, the 27th, the 28th, 29th, uh, 20, well, the 29th, it would have been a pass. It looks like he didn't play. I'm looking at the column that is right next, is sandwiched in between PA and 2B. PA stands for plate appearance, 2B stands for a double, so I'm looking at the H column. That's the hit column. Did he get a hit that day? On June 2nd, he did not get a hit. He went 0 for 4. But every day before that, he was hitting like, like crazy. He was hitting. And then guess what? The next day, what did he do? He went 5 for 5. So he went 0 for 4, and then he went 5 for 5. Uh, predicting who is going to get a hit is just a really thing. It's a really difficult thing to do. What happened that day? It's hard to say. Uh, he wasn't necessarily facing like the ex, the, the best pitcher in the world. Um, maybe he had a little bit of heartburn. Uh, maybe that threw off his swing. These are like the human elements of the game that you just can't predict, right? Maybe he got a bad night's sleep. Maybe he had a fight with his girlfriend or his wife or a, a teammate. You just don't know. Um, maybe you know. Maybe. He just wasn't feeling it that day. But it goes to show you why you can't just pick the best hitter every single day, because the best hitter, again, he's batting 400. Six out of 10 times, he's failing. So let's talk about how we could potentially build a model to help us predict who's going to get a hit tomorrow. So remember, what you could technically do is you could wait until all the games are played tonight. You could load all that data up into your model, retrain your model, and it's going to spit out a, predict, a prediction for tomorrow's games, right? So everything, we could go, we could make it that exact. We could do that. What kinds of things do you think you should put into the model? So you don't really know how, need to like be a baseball expert to answer this question. Just take a moment and think for yourself. We've already named a few, but go ahead, raise your hand, call it out. It's up to you. What would you throw into a machine learning model to help you predict tomorrow's hitter? Height of, height of the hitter. Say again? The height of the hitter. Yeah, the height of the hitter, um, the size of the hitter, you know, like 
Luis Arise is actually a really small guy compared to a lot of MLB players. Technically, high average players are usually those more athletic, sort of smaller guys than like the big time sluggers who get up there and are just trying to hit home runs. Yep, so absolutely. I mean, when you talk about baseball players, it's, sometimes it gets a little uncomfortable because you're talking about their bodies, but it's, it's part of the game. The athletic body of a player is very much important for predicting whether they're going to get a hit. What else? Yep, the ERA of the pitcher, how, how, that's one way to measure how successful the pitcher has been up until that point. So yeah, perfect. The, how good is the pitcher? Uh, some sort of aggregate assessment of the bullpen? Yes, perfect. An aggregate assessment of the bullpen. How good is the bullpen as a whole? Um, you can look at the worst bullpen in all of MLB and just pick that team, right? So yeah, very good. What else? Weather. Weather, absolutely. Weather is good. Um, it's a little bit tricky, right, because a storm could roll in, you know, you can sort, it's, weather is hard to predict, right? So it's hard to predict the exact weather at game time. But um, things like location of the stadium and the weather of that region is, is more predictable, right? It's more consistent, more constant. So for example, one, um, maybe not weather, but one environmental effect, uh, games that are played in Colorado have thinner air. Right? So the ball is going to fly farther. Colorado also has a really huge um, outfield. So balls find locations to land. Baseball stadiums are not unique. Uh, I'm sorry, they, each baseball stadium is unique. They're not like uniform. They don't, they don't all have the same dimensions. So the ballpark is good. What else? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that, I've actually written an article about that. My article was about spring training, and the funny thing is every single player, it's like a common, uh, it's like something that gets repeated. I f I'm in the best shape of my life. That's what they all say in spring training. Literally every batter always, I'm in the best shape of my life. So you could do that. You could see what their sentiment is like in that exact uh, day before the game, yeah. Injuries? Injuries, yeah, absolutely. Like, obviously if someone's injured, they're not going to play the next day, but the point that you're making is, um, if a guy has an elbow injury and he's playing through it, you know, baseball players are tough, he's playing through the injury, he's going to perform a little bit worse. It's tricky, though, because they don't always tell you how their elbow is feeling before the game. Some of them do. Some of them try to hide their injuries. One last one. What else we got? One last one. Very good. Left-handed pitcher um, versus left-handed or right-handed batter, right? So one, one way to think about this, and now I get to use the bat. If I'm a right-handed batter, and I'm standing here waiting for the pitch, right, and the uh, pitcher is a right-handed pitcher throwing the ball, a right-handed pitcher can throw a ball that is going to come in, and from the pitcher's perspective, it could look like it's about to hit their head. I know, because somebody just did this to me, and it made me look so foolish in front of all my teammates. A curveball comes, it looks like it's about to hit your head, and then it just slides into the strike zone, and it's called a strike. So a left-handed pitcher can't do that as easily to a, a, a right-handed batter. They have to change their approach and their pitching. So all very good things that you just mentioned. These are all, you know, some, some that you said already, some that um, other people have said in other talks, some that I just thought of. So, you know, uh, some of these are are predictable, like what did the player eat for dinner before the game? Those, those are things that are not predictable. We couldn't put that into a machine learning model. So there's tons of data out there. There's tons of things that we theoretically could use. There's also publicly available data that um, we could use, you know, a little bit more effectively, right? We wouldn't have to conduct the sentiment analysis. We wouldn't have to look, research player injuries. We could just pull down this data for every single pitch that's thrown. This data is publicly available. You can download it. Anybody here could download it from, from, the base, from MLB's website. And every single time a pitch is thrown, this data comes out. There's so much here that I, you know, I couldn't even fit it in one screenshot. So now, from an um, analytics perspective, we have to filter that down, right? Because not everything that is here, in fact, very, very, very little of what is here 
you can predict for t tomorrow's game with any, um, any level of certainty. It's very, very difficult to take what you know happened and then generate what, what will happen tomorrow from that in this case. And here's an example of this. You can see that launch angle, okay, so launch angle is when the ball is struck off the bat and it, the, the batter hits it, it's the angle in which the ball flies off the bat, right? So you can imagine that if I swing down on the ball and I mash the ball into the ground, that's a negative angle from, from, the, from the bat. That's a negative angle going down, right? And it's just going to pound into the ground. There's plenty of fielders out there who are ready to pick up that ball and throw you out. So that's not good. It's not good to have a negative launch angle or it's not good to hit a ground ball. So this histogram just shows you um, in training data where a launch angle usually is for hits, right? So it's, it's, it's much more confined into that sort of like 15 to 30 range. Non-hits are, are much more spread out, right? So we could say, okay, well that's a good indication of a hit, um, the launch angle, right? But the problem is, and launch angle is on the uh, y-axis, release position is on the x-axis. We could use all kinds of different things for the x-axis to show a relationship. But the point that I'm trying to make with the green band going across here is that, um, and that represents hits, the red dots, I should have put in a key there, I just realized that, but the um, red dots are non-hits, the green dots are hits. Well, green dots are, are in that band with a launch angle, right? So we know, okay, that's, it's good to have your launch angle in that, in that window, in that band. But it doesn't matter where the pitch is, where the pitch is being thrown. Every pitch from every release position can be hit at that, with that launch angle. So launch angle is, is predictive of a hit, but it's not something, launch angle itself is not pre very predictable tomorrow. We can certainly aggregate over a season and say, this hitter has an average launch angle. We use that metric all the time. But when you're thinking about every single day, if you've watched a baseball game, the hitter could hit the, hit the ball into the ground, up into the air, hit a line drive. They're not consistently hitting a certain launch angle. Over time, they can average out to a certain um, launch angle, and you could, you could sort of use that as a metric of performance. But you're not going to be able to input it into a machine learning deployment data set because it's very hard to predict what launch angle a batter will uh, be um, creating tomorrow. So we need something that will sort of better explain launch angle. Launch angle, any hitter can launch the ball at any angle. And Ted Williams in his, in his book talked about um, a, an upswing, a slight upswing. That's what you see here. So hitters were uh, traditionally taught to swing down on the ball because you make contact that way. So swinging down on the ball is going to put the ball on the ground, right? Ted Williams argued in like 1970, that's when the book was written and first published, 1970. He argued that you want to have an upswing on the ball. So when you're coming through and you're, you're swinging, you want to have a slight upswing because that's going to put the ball into the air more often. And balls in the air more often are better, uh, are more, um, likely to fall for a hit than it is if you just mash it into the ground to the shortstop. He's going to gobble it up, he's going to throw it to first, and you're going to be out, unless you're super fast, and unless you hit the ball super, super hard that it gets by the shortstop. But this is something that we can use to actually measure nowadays. Ted Williams talked about it in 1970, but now we're actually using um, biometric data, and really um, there's a group called Swing Graphs that puts this uh, data out. For every hitter, it's an average right now, but very soon, as I understand it, it will be on that pitch level data. They'll be able to tell us what the angle of the bat, the angle of the swing is. And that is very, 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 re um, is very consistent. The angle of a, of a batter's swing is very consistent. It's what they work on all day long. They're in the batting cage working to make an angle of their bat that is um, good and consistent. And this is on SwingGraph's website. They're giving us interactive um, maps just to show it. So you can see that blue circle going around the bat, the batter there, is just explaining the angle in which they're, they're using to connect with the ball. If it's a flat angle, it's not very good for hits. So if it's flattening out, um, hitters are going to have less success. 
So that's only one part of the real secret ingredient that I have working in my machine, my machine learning model here. And the second one is the vertical approach angle of the pitch. So I stood here with the bat. I also walked over here to act like I'm a pitcher, which I am not. And the angle of the pitch coming from the release point of the pitcher. So if you imagine the ball is going to be released here, right? This is going to have a negative angle. Why? Because gravity is acting on the ball. No pitcher has ever been able to defy gravity with their, with their pitch. It's never happened. And it's not going to happen. But we can measure, with all the things that I showed you on the screen, and with this calculation, we can measure the vertical approach angle of the pitch as it comes in. And here's just a, a little bit of an image. It's not the best because it's a screenshot from a YouTube video, but it's called Simple Sabermetrics made this really excellent video explaining what vertical approach angle is. And this shows you, first of all, why it will always be negative, because it's coming from the plane of release, right? So it's, if it were negative, it would like hit the umpire in the head. Um, and it would not even, you know, it wouldn't be in the zone. So it has to come down into the, that's also because the pitcher is standing up on a mound, right? So they're standing raised up above the, the, the batter. So this is going to come in, and it's going to be negative. Now, when you put those two things together, that is really going to help us figure out uh, the likelihood of a hit. Because if you have a batter who's swinging his bat at an angle that is exactly on plane with that pitch, then you have something. You have the ball coming in, and you have a batter who has an angle that's going to meet that ball on the plane. And when you can do that, if you're a great hitter and you can match the plane of the pitch with the plane with the swing of your bat, you're going to hit the ball right in the sweet spot of the bat, and that's how you get a hit. Ted Williams thought that's how you get it. He was one of the best hitters of all time. I'm believing him, and I'm building a model from that. So here's what training data looks like. You may have seen me, um, those of you in the DAX community, you may have seen me uh, give this talk um, uh, last summer at a uh, DataWorks event. The model has changed a little bit since I first gave this talk. Um, Scott, I was thinking about what you said about like tinkering and constantly iterating on machine learning. You basically explained what I'm doing here uh, really well. Um, it's my passion project, right? So, Nobody's paying me to do this. Like, nobody has a deadline for me. Nobody is demanding anything. I've tweaked this model over and over and over again. And I'll be honest with you, I'll probably tweak it some more. Um, but that's OK. I think it's kind of fun. So essentially what I'm using for my deployment, uh, I'm sorry. So that says deployment data. I should say training data. This is training data, not deployment data. That's just a typo. You see the release position. Um, Metrics that identify every pitcher and where they release the ball. Somebody said something about uh, the batter's height. This includes the pitcher's height now. If a really tall pitcher is releasing the ball here, that's a measurement that's explaining this. If a, a really short pitcher is, some pitchers release sidearm, that's explaining this, right? Then I have vertical approach angle of that specific pitch. I have park factors. This is a way to measure how nice of a hit environment uh, the stadium is. If it's over 100, it's over average. If it's below 100, it's below average. Here I have uh, five pitches all occurring from the same pitcher in, um, in, you'll also notice this is the same pitcher. The release positions are fairly um, consistent, but they're different pitches. Change up, slider, curveball, fastball, that type of thing. That's why the, the metrics on the individual pitch is different and the angle of the pitch is different. That top negative 9.5 is a very, very steep pitch, very likely a curveball coming. So we have park factors. We have the zone. Where is the pitch actually entering the zone? Is it in the zone? Is it right in the middle? Is it to the outside? Is it, a, is it technically a ball? We have the launch speed, how hard it was hit. That's something that I'll have to aggregate. We have the vertical bat angle of the pitcher, uh, I'm sorry, of the hitter. And you can see that this is the same hitter against the same pitcher. And one of these five was a hit. That's my training data. I'm, getting, I'm targeting that binary hit, 0, 1. Whew. Now we have to actually, after all that talking and gathering and cleaning and discussing, now we have to like, deploy a data, uh, deploy a model. So what I do every day, every morning, while I'm drinking my coffee and um, I'm thinking about how bad traffic is going to be on my way to work, 
uh, I'm creating matchups. So I'll go and I'll scrape MLB's website to get the probable pitchers for that day. There's a challenge there because the manager doesn't have to tell you who's pitching for their team until like two hours before the game. So because I do this in the morning, sometimes the pitcher hasn't been announced and I have to sort of guess who the pitcher is. I pay way too much uh, attention to baseball, so I'm pretty good at doing that. I need a, I need a new hobby. Um, park factors, that's, you know, where are they playing? Is it in Colorado or is it in some park that's um, better for the pitcher? So I, I, I'm really simulating, in a way, I'm simulating pitching, okay? Because, to use the Kershaw example, let's say Kershaw is pitching tomorrow. I don't know how many curveballs Clayton Kershaw is going to throw. I don't know how long he's going to last. I don't know um, if his velocity is going to be where it was yesterday. But I'm going to be fairly certain. I'm going to take his averages and I'm going to basically simulate a bunch of those pitches and all of those pitch metrics and I'm going to use that as my deployment data set. So essentially I'm taking things that he's already done and I'm simulating more of it by changing it ever so slightly and adding variation to it. I'm doing the same thing with hitting. So if I know Luis Arise is a left-handed batter and he has lately just been mashing the ball, hitting it super hard, um, I'm going to include that as an aggregated data point in my, in my um, deployment data. I'm going to Combine those two data sets, those two simulations together in pitcher-hitter uh, matchups, and then I'm going to predict. And I put here predict plus because there's absolutely no way that this model is, you know, it's a good enough, robust enough model where it can just spit out three picks and I'll believe them. Um, and as a writer, I have to be really careful because if I were to do that and tweet it out, I would get blasted. There's a comment section on every Fangraphs article I write, and I still get blasted. And people always like say, you're stupid. That doesn't make sense. That's a dumb way to do it. Um, so if I were to tweet out bad picks, like that would happen worse, and it makes me feel bad. I don't want that. So those are the daily steps. I take the matchups. I scrape this information from MLB. Don't tell MLB. I haven't had my IP address banned yet, but um, if I click you know, Control Enter too many times, it might happen one of these days. So I have to be weary of that. I create a table, one row per pitcher. I merge in the park factors for the starting pitcher. And there you have the teams and their opposing pitcher. I then bring in all the information for those pitchers, right? And I assume a lot. Not a lot. It's not that much to assume that somebody's going to do what they usually do. But I'm essentially assuming that a pitcher is going to do what he usually does. Here's information on Shane McClanahan, the starting pitcher for the Rays this day. He throws a fastball 42% of the time, a changeup 24% of the time, a curveball 18% of the time, and a slider 14% of the time. You can see by the heat map, he also generally locates his pitches in a certain area. So when I'm creating simulated pitching data, I'm basically just going to simulate what Shane McClanahan usually does. I can also do the same thing for hitters. So I know enough at this point in the season to know that uh, Masataka Yoshida of the Boston Red Sox, he has one vertical bat angle that he's been hitting with in the month of May, um, in this case. Um, he hits the ball in these ranges, and he had one changeup that he smoked, 99.8, almost 100 miles per hour. So this is all previous data that I'm basically altering and changing to simulate what the hitter is going to do based off of like what they've been doing so far this season. And I can also um, dig into that a little bit more. So here's, here's this change up to Yoshida. It was a um, 84 mile an hour change up. It's likely that Luke Weaver, the pitcher in this case, and the next time he pitches, he's going to throw change ups like this. And Masataka Yoshida is going to hit the ball at a certain speed. Once I combine all that together, I have um, my deployment data set. What hitters, I, basically I generate a, uh, a lot of Pitches from pitchers, I generate a lot of batted ball metrics from hitters. I mash them together, and I look at what is most likely to become a hit. Um, so this is what I was talking about with predict plus. So one day, this, uh, the model said that Martin Maldonado was going to get a hit. He's the most likely to get a hit. Martin Maldonado is a bad hitter. He's only hitting 203 on the season. That's bad. Um, really bad. The average in the MLB is like 260. 
and my model spit him out as the most likely batter for that day. What is happening there? It's a lot to do with his swing path that day, the pitch that he hit um, in the training data, his, the angle of his bat, the angle of the pitcher's release point, they matched up really well, and in this case, um, thought that the matchup, and in, in addition to the place where the game was being held, was a really good factor. So when I say predict plus, I mean it's really important for me to sort out what I just really do not believe. Somebody in my last talk said they went up and looked, did he get a hit that day, and he didn't play. He's also a catcher, so he's in the MLB because he's an incredible catcher, and it's really, really difficult to be an incredible catcher and even a good hitter. Usually you're one of two. So here's the zones. This is just to show you, like, I have a general sense of where the pitcher is putting the ball, especially um, certain types of pitches, right? Um, okay, so when I say predict plus, I then take all of my model's picks and I aggregate them. I say, well, which batter has the most uh, likelihood, the most, basically the most pitches in the, in the deployment data set with, pos with really good scores? And in this case, once I aggregate it down, it starts to make a lot more sense. In Martin Maldonado's case, he essentially was an outlier uh, in the training data set. Again, this is the reason that I'm iterating and tweaking my model on a constant basis, right? Because somewhere in the data set, those metrics combined to produce a hit. But what happened, I don't know. Maybe it was somebody fast with a similar bat angle who just legged out uh, a single and it was marked as a hit, right? I'm not in my model, remember, I'm just using a binary 0, 1, so I'm not saying really good hit or really bad hit. A hit is a hit. A home run and a single are the same thing in my model, right? So in this case, once I aggregate it down, I have a lot better understanding who's the hitter who's in my, in my model's predictions um, the most, who has the best scores. And in this case, on this day, it was Bo Bichette of the Toronto Blue Jays. Um, you'll see a lot of missing values here. This is just a, a, a problem, a data problem. When I bring in information, um, I'm only given season-wide statistics. This is what I'm bringing in here. I'm bringing in season-wide statistics to say, okay, well, how good has this hitter been this year? And there's missing values because it's only, the API only gives me qualified hitters and pitchers. If they're not qualified, it won't bring in their data. Qualified means you've had enough um, you've played enough games this season to qualify for awards at the end of the season. You've been around long enough this season. So, for example, you see Danny Jansen, the second best, he's not a qualified hitter. He hasn't been around long enough this season. And the pitcher he's going up against is not qualified either. This is a data issue. Um, it's one that I'm constantly emailing the, create, the, the people who manage the API about. They haven't gotten back to me. I don't know why. Maybe if I told them I talk at DAX, they'll give me a little bit more respect. Um, but it's just a data issue. It happens, right? So the, the bottom row, Jonathan Scope, he's not qualified, but the pitcher he's going up against is. And so I can see the pitcher so far has uh, played 12 games. He's given up 5.5 hits per game that he's played in. That's, that's a little bit actually below average, so he's, he's a pretty good pitcher. All right, now I get to evaluate performance, and basically all I'm doing at this point is I'm comparing my picks with MLB's picks. If you remember Nate Lowe, um, the model, the MLB model said that he was the second likeliest to get a hit. I checked out his scores in my model. My model, don't try not to pay too much attention to the probability of hit and probability of no hit. Um, these scores are like 68, 69% likelihood of getting a hit. The best hitters in my outputs are usually about 73% chance to get a hit, so he, he was not even in the aggregated output, the export, right? And um, my model is not really thinking that he's that great. He's not bad, but he's not great. So again, 73% for the probability of hit for uh, Bo Bichette. My model likes Bo Bichette a lot more. I can bring in and look at why does my model like Bo Bichette? It really likes him. Uh, it really likes him against the changeup. So what I can do is I can go in and I can look at the pitcher's changeup. Is it good? Is it bad? I could spend the whole morning doing this. I wouldn't show up to work. My manager would call me and be like, where are you? And I'd be like, I'm still working on baseball stuff. That wouldn't be a good look for me. So usually I have to make a pick and move on. So did, did uh, Bobachet get a hit? Yes, he did. 
My model guessed right. Thank you, thank you. My streak went to uh, three that day. I'm one step closer to being a millionaire. Nate Lowe, he also got a hit. He got two hits. He went two for five. Bo Bichette went two for three. I like Bo Bichette better. So both of them got a hit. In my evaluation process, I'm kind of putting them up against each other. We can watch Bo Bichette's hit, I think. Here we go. We're sounding off. And shot into right field, a base hit. Just another kind of typical, classic Bo Bichette at bat here in 2023. Man, that feels good, doesn't it? <laughs> feels good to predict the future. So there we have it. My model is, you know, it's had some um, challenges getting up and running to start the season. There should be more than 15 games. I think right now MLB is probably around like 50 games, so you can see that I've been slacking a little bit. Jolt's success rate so far is predicted to hit 75% of the time, and MLB is predicted to hit 80% of the time. At this point, it was actually 45 games, so 45 observations. So I'm a little bit behind MLB, um, but again, I'm going to go back and I'm going to tinker. I'm going to play with it. Uh, there's a couple things that I'd like to change, and here are some of them. First of all, I'd like to evaluate those odd picks a little bit better. My, my model is definitely overfitting in certain cases. There's no doubt about that. Mal Martin Maldonado was a perfect example of an overfit. Um, I need to go back and correct for that. I need to dig into my training data to figure out why that is. He shouldn't be, um, the, the metrics that he had shouldn't have been recorded as a hit. So it's definite that I have to go back and I have to maybe change the way I'm categorizing a hit in my training data. Again, sometimes somebody gets a hit and really they shouldn't have gotten a hit. It was an error that wasn't actually marked as an error, but it really should have been an error and now they're on base and they get the hit. They feel good, but the pitcher doesn't. So, I need to go back and really evaluate those overfits. Eventually, I want to, you know, it's very close to automated at this point. Very, very close. I'm at the point where I'm sipping my coffee, I'm click and go, it spits out my predictions for the day, and I just predict plus. I take a look at, you know, do I believe that or not? But that needs to be tightened up. It needs to be automated a little bit more so that um, it can actually tweet out my picks, that I can maybe oversee those those top three picks, and then I can tweet them out to the masses, everybody who, my 10 followers who, who want to follow who, who's uh, getting a hit. I want to add in batted ball vertical bat angle data. So right now I have um, season, uh, I have monthly angle, bat angle, right? So it's, it, it's too much to assume that a batter is going to have that same bat angle all season long. Pretty soon MLB will be releasing batted ball every single time ball is connected with um, angles. So I'll be able to use that even more effectively in my training data and in my deployment data set. Um, I want to move beyond those averages. I, I want to find a better way to just aggregate all of the, all of the strong picks of the model into that predict plus. I, I want to sort of move beyond that because it, it kind of treats all the pitches the same when you aggregate it down, right? Sliders, change-ups, curve balls, they're all being treated the same and being scored in the same way. And then finally, um, I got to figure out that API problem. I need to br bring in that extra data for all pitcher and hitter matchups so that there's no missing values and I can really evaluate it a little bit better manually. And then I want to win. I want to win $5.6 million. Probably will never happen, but it's good fun playing. Thanks so much. I know uh, the last talk made you um, really excited about data. The talk before that made you probably really thirsty hearing about all that wine. I'm thirsty. I know everybody's looking forward to getting to the cocktail hour, but I'd like to thank you for listening in about baseball. Um, I write at Fangraphs. You can find me on Twitter if I ever end up tweeting out my picks. And if anybody has any very specific questions about my model, this is a passion project. I'm happy to talk about it. I'm happy if anybody had an idea come into their head that they'd like to share. And um, thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah.
Yeah, that's, no, it is, it, it's a good question. It's a simulation, but you have to be careful that, right, so my model is trained up in, for the most part, very currently, right? So what I'm doing is I am taking what's happened in this season right now. So let's say my model is trained all the way until Monday. And right now I'm gathering data Tuesday to Saturday today. And I'm looking what are hitters doing in that little time span that is not being touched by my training data set. Because I wouldn't want to take that data and throw it into a prediction, right? You never want to train and deploy on the same data. So what I'm doing is I'm essentially taking that little bit of data that the model has not seen, and I'm, I guess maybe you could call it extrapolating. I'm saying, here's the baseline, here's what this hitter hit a change up. Let's alter that just a little bit with some deviations to make more of that data. I need more examples of him hitting a change up. And let's do something else. Let's change where that pitch was, and let's change um, how hard he hit it. So there are things that you can tweak because there's a range of that player's ability. I know how hard he can hit the ball. If I were to say um, so-and-so is going to hit the ball 110 miles an hour, so-and-so has never hit the ball 110 miles an hour. So that's sort of what I mean by simulation. I'm not totally making it up, but I'm also not using data points that my training data, that's involved in my training data. Good question, thanks. What if a game gets rained out? Uh, you be, if you had a pick and the game gets rained out and you've submitted your pick already, it's a wash. No pun intended. Uh, just basically your streak, if it was at 10, it wouldn't go back down to zero. You're, you're fine. It basically just like lets you move on. Because that batter didn't get a chance to hit. Right? He didn't not get a hit and he didn't get a hit. So um, it's But a your wash. streak won't extend if the game gets rained. It, it won't extend, but it won't go back down to zero. Yeah. I have a couple couple of curiosity questions. First, uh, disclaimer: I don't know a first shy knoll about uh, sports history, um, but uh, I'm wondering was was there any big changes to uh, the like pitching uh, community around the you know like the 30s and 40s that you mentioned that might have like did like pitching become more sophisticated in that time and that contributed to this greater variance in batting performance? Yeah, how much time you got? <laughs> we could talk no, it, after. I, I'm yeah, just yeah, sort of it's, curious. it's amazing. I mean, just the, the influence of data on the game of baseball is mind blowing. Mm -hmm. And the things that pitchers are doing nowadays with, with baseball, I mean, I went to a conference in Arizona all about baseball analytics, and they're talking about seam shifted wake. They're looking at the physics uh, of a ball as it moves. I couldn't even really explain it, but it got as deep as PhDs in fluid dynamics explaining. Uh, pitch motion. So there's so, some serious metagaming. Absolutely, going on. absolutely. I mean, the, even the, even among the professionals, like oh, I, like I've known about like fantasy. Well, that's fantasy. And MLB I teams are just pumping money into into analytics. It's it, and the reason that baseball compared to other sports is so open to analytics is because there's a gigantic data set. Huge. Mm -hmm. I mean, every time a pitch is thrown, you saw all the data points that are associated with it, right? So mm -hmm. it's gotten pretty advanced. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a uh, uh, second question, uh, which record do you think is more likely to be broken, Joe DiMaggio's or Wade Boggs? What, Wade Boggs' hit streak or his <laughs> batting average? <laughs> I'm talking about, uh, no, I'm talking about the, the... His beer drinking? Yes. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, definitely Wade Boggs. Wade Boggs is a famous baseball player because apparently he drank like 50-something beers on the plane ride to home from a game or something like that. I don't know. But yeah, I think that could be broken. Yeah. All right, thanks. Yeah. So if I understood this, what I was seeing in your slides correctly, it looks like the difference between the best guy in your model each day and the second best guy in your model is very, very small. Yeah. So I'm asking the question to help me understand the model. Does it make sense to do the double up every single day and give yourself twice as many chances to, you know, you, you then only have to get like a 28-day streak instead of a 58-day streak. So you've got twice as many opportunities to do it in a season. Yeah, Is definitely. that plausible? So might... Absolutely. I mean, the model scores are not very varied enough because um, the training data going into it is all very similar. I mean, it's difficult to, with the inputs that I'm using, to really different, make really big dif differentiating factors, right? So the model scores end up being um, really tight. And um, that's definitely something that I'm working on you know, building out, whether it's ensembling in multiple models, whatever it might be. But you're right, those predictions need to be a little bit more distinct and varied. Um, the double down is hard because 
you know, like you get to, you, if, you, if you're lucky enough to get to like 15, and then tomorrow you realize how hard it was to get there, and then tomorrow you have to predict two correctly, um, it's just such a gamble, you know, like it's, it's really difficult to predict one person to get a hit, it's really difficult to predict two people to get a hit. I'm up here telling you all about a model, but like I'm under, under the understanding that this is maybe something that can't be modeled. <laughs> that's a terrible way to finish, but um, I think you have, that's a really important thing for a data scientist to have, you know, is, is real um, suspicion about your, your model. Trusting your data, trusting your process, but then knowing that a guy could have just had a bad night's sleep and you, couldn't, you can't measure that, you just can't. So um, it's fun. Maybe you all will, will download the app and play. I'm not getting anything if you do. Uh, it's just something fun that you can do. And um, I want to thank Jason and Dax for having me here. I hope you enjoyed the conference, and I thank you very much for uh, listening.